Lecture number one, river processes and landforms. I have five specific topics that I want to talk to you about. And I want to begin with the drainage basin. It's a stream network bounded by a divide. And I want to start with the stream network. What a stream network is composed of is a whole series of tributaries. And what they are are small streams flowing into progressively larger ones. And here we've got a nice example of a stream network making up a drainage basin. Now what I want to do is talk to you about is the boundary of a drainage basin, the divide. What a divide represents is the highest elevation in an area, it's usually going to be a hill or a mountain ridge, dividing flow between drainage basins. So if you've got a rainstorm, imagine, you know, the rain hitting this bottom drainage basin, the, you know, overland flow, it's going to, you know, be pulled by gravity downslope and feed, say, this tributary and this drainage basin. And then, you know, conversely, this top drainage basin, again, the, you know, rain will hit the ground, he'll have overland flow or runoff, and eventually feeding this tributary and this drainage basin here. So it's called the divide because it literally divides flow. Now, actually, within a drainage basin, you can make a whole hierarchy of different drainage basins. And so you have drainage basins actually within drainage basins, if you think about it. I mean, here here I've drawn in one drainage basin here for this little tributary. There's got to be some higher elevation, some divide, some drainage divide that's dividing flow between this tributary and this next tributary system, and then this next tributary system. If I can go even smaller, I can say there's got to be some higher elevation but these between these two tiny little tributaries and I could make a little tiny drainage basin right there. And here's kind of a larger drainage basin. You know, you can draw in a whole hierarchy, all right, uh, within the larger one. That's what they're trying to illustrate here. So there's got to be some divide, some higher elevation, right, between uh, tributaries. And here's actually kind of a small scale example of this. I took this picture out in California, driving in the main valley, the main river valley. And you can actually see uh, the outer divide right, of the main drainage basin. And then you can actually make up some smaller drainage basins. And you can actually see uh, this hill crest, right? This is the divide here. And then we take the outer divide and then another inner divide here. And we've just created a drainage basin for this one dry uh, tributary. You can do the same thing here. I mean, there's another drainage basin you can actually see. And so here's a divide within the larger drainage basin. And so here's a nice diagram from the book. So this would be the divide, all right? And then you've got an overland flow feeding these uh, tributaries. So you can wind up creating, you know, this crazy hierarchy of drainage basins. And here's the drainage basin of the Mississippi River system. It really drains, I mean, 41% of the United States and is made up of a whole series of, you know, the drainage basins within this larger drainage basin. You've got the Ohio Basin, the Upper Mississippi, the Missouri, the Arkansas, and the Red, and then just the Mississippi River itself. And then actually within, you know, just breaking the larger basin down, I mean, you can even, you can, like I said, you can go crazy by, you know, drawing in individual drainage basins for each individual tributary. All right, the second topic is something called the Continental Divide. And it's nothing more than the largest drainage divide on a continent. Now, it's going to be a mountain range, and it's going to be uh, a mountain range that divides the biggest rivers on a continent. Now, for the United States, our Continental Divide is the ridge crest of the Rocky Mountains. And it divides rivers flowing westward, you know, big rivers flowing westward into the Pacific, versus rivers flowing eastward into the Miss Mississippi River. And here we've got a you know picture of some of the main rivers of the United States. And uh, you know, so here Colorado, right, rises on the west slopes of the Rocky Mountains and eventually flows into the Pacific Ocean. But on the other side of that mountain ridge crest is the headwaters of the Arkansas River. And that's a big river again flowing into the Mississippi. And we could kind of look at the same thing here for the upper reaches of the Missouri River flowing eastward. Big river, big tributary flowing into the Mississippi, you know, versus the you know, Columbia and Snake River. There's got to be some higher ridge crest, right, that's dividing the flow westward versus eastward. Third topic are waterfalls. And a big point about waterfalls is that they're not stationary. They actually move through time. 
Um, it, what a uh, what a waterfall is is really just kind of an area steepened gradient uh, of the stream bed, and it's usually due to you know some rock geology, some different rock geology, you know rock structure, some stronger rock. But the thing is, once you have this steepened gradient, what you're going to wind up with is you know greater velocity of the water you know, in the waterfall, and what that's going to wind up doing is eroding the base of the fall. And so you wind up creating a scour pool, undermining the base of the fall. And so what's going to wind up happening now, you wind up the top is going to start to collapse in. And so usually you see big boulders uh, in the scour pool. And so through time, you, you're going to wind up with retreat upstream of that waterfall. And here's an example here. I mean, you know, so repeat, repeat, repeat. And it's called, you know, headward erosion. Um, meaning that uh, you're eroding the falls towards the headwaters where the river begins or upstream by that process of undermining and then the top collapsing. I want to give you two really good examples of waterfalls, you know, migrating upstream. You know, in Yellowstone National Park, here's uh, here's beautiful uh, Yellowstone Falls, you know, iconic waterfalls of, of that park. But actually, you know, over geologic time spans, uh, Yellowstone Falls have been eroding headward upstream, creating this deep, deep gorge as it's eroded. And uh, further upstream is the Ni is the uh, Yellowstone River, right? And I can't even see it. I don't even know where it's going to be. But we know what's going to happen to that Yellowstone River at, with the retreat uh, upstream of these falls as it's you know, going to erode by the process just described. Another really great example of headward erosion of waterfalls is Niagara Falls. They have uh, migrated seven miles upstream since they were formed you know, at the end of the Ice Age, you know, about 12,000 12, years ago. And here's the, you know, the Niagara River, and there these falls, here's the big horseshoe falls, have eroded upstream, like I said, seven miles. And uh, yeah, so here's a, a picture of uh, the, the rock structure. Here's a you know different geology, and this is where the waterfalls began. And they've been eroding a gorge upstream seven miles upstream, and so this is where they are now. And it is kind of noteworthy, you know, they've got actually diagrams as to where the top of the falls were, and you know how they uh, the falls have migrated upstream. And here we are in 2011. Beautiful falls. Uh, and they really represent the fastest moving waterfalls in the world, uh, you know, ranging, you know, from year to year, uh, anywhere from uh, erosion of one feet to up to five feet per year. So that's kind of an interesting, you know, example of headward erosion of waterfalls. A fourth topic that I want to talk to you about is something known as the stream load. And besides water, river carries materials in three ways. And the first way that I want to uh, talk to you about is, is called the dissolve load. And here we've got the dissolve load it'll, illustrated here. And really what it represents is chemicals dissolved, uh, you know, in the water. It's pollution. In, you know, in particular. And unfortunately, you know, most rivers uh, in the world are highly polluted, hence, you know, having a high dissolve load. And here's an, ex an example of the Cuyahoga River. And this is a, a tributary uh, to, the, o to the Ohio River system. And look at the sign behind it, okay, attached to, to it. It's flammable. This river has caught on fire all right it has more than once <laughs> and so that is telling you something when water can catch on fire all right it's very disturbing now of course the mississippi river has a tremendous dissolve load is highly polluted now remember it is all it uh, drains you know uh, 41 percent of the united states you know you've got the agricultural heartland of the upper midwest so you've got agricultural runoff, then there are big cities, and so you've got urban runoff, and then you've got particularly big industries in Louisiana, the so-called chemical corridor between Baton Rouge and, and, and New Orleans, where, you know, petrochemical uh, industries are, you know, are, are actually allowed uh, to, uh, to uh, dump, I mean, uh, a certain amount of their toxic waste uh, into the into the Mississippi River, so I mean we're really highly polluted, unfortunately. 
All right, the second way in which rivers uh, carry uh, their load is something called the suspended load. Now, uh, the suspended load are the tiniest uh, particles of silt and clay that are so tiny they can be held in constant turbulent suspension throughout the water column. And so since they're held in turbulent suspension throughout, you know, throughout the depth of the water, it gives the water a murky color, you know, usually kind of a murky brown color. And that is a pretty good indicator of a high suspended load. And of course, the Mississippi River does have a, a tremendous suspended sediment load. And, you know, it's kind of a murky brown color and it's called the muddy Mississippi. I mean, that, so that's the indicator of that. Yeah, and uh, I actually went to uh, a conference in the middle of the Amazon River Basin in the, near the town of uh, in the town of Manaus uh, in Brazil, and we took a boat ride uh, where uh, a tributary called the Rio Negro uh, enters uh, into the into the Amazon River, and the, there's a, a tremendous amount of deforestation going on, you know, in the Rio Negro, and so you, you know you wind up with a lot of you know, erosion going on once you move the protective vegetative cover. And we took this boat ride, and for seven miles, you've got this sharp boundary uh, between the murky colors of the tributary and the clear uh, waters of the Amazon. And so we, I took about a million pictures, and I don't know how I ever chose this one, but that's that's how you can tell. Uh, so anyways, yeah, so the, the, again, the, the, uh, the source of, you know, a high suspended load is, you know, rivers, you know, tiny silts and clays giving that murky uh, color. And, you know, it's a big indicator uh, of erosion in that individual tributary drainage basin. And look at this river in Madagascar. This is a, a, a tropical island off the coast of East Africa. And look at this. this uh, the tropical rainforest has all been cut down. And once you move the, all that protective vegetative cover in a high rainfall environment, you have massive erosion. Right? And it's called scarification of the land with all of this gullying. And you can just take a look at the murky color here, indicating a high suspended load. Well, we're talking about the Mississippi River drainage basin, you know, draining, you know, 41% of the United States. You know, as it turns out, most of the sediment actually comes from its western tributaries. It's kind of a dry climate, semi-arid climate, and it's a major agricultural area. And so what winds up happening, you know, particularly during uh, uh, winter time, when the fields are fallow and you're not being cultivated, you know, you just have, you know, uh, exposed soil. And if you do have a rainstorm, I mean, you're going to have tremendous amounts of erosion going on, contributing to uh, the tributary system in the West. And here's an example of one little tributary. This is the Platte River, and this flows into the Missouri River. And here you can see an agricultural field here. But you can just see how fragile and easily eroded this landscape is. Um, yeah, and so, yeah. But the, and the other thing, too, is, you know, so most of the sediment comes from the western tributaries, but actually most of the water for the, the river comes from the eastern tributaries. You know, the, you know, the eastern, uh, east of the Mississippi River is kind of a, you know, a rainy, moist climate, you know, where you've got the maritime tropical air of the Gulf of Mexico moving up, getting caught in the westerlies, bringing all that moisture to the, you know, the eastern coast of the U.S., I mean, the empty air of the Gulf really doesn't affect the western United States so much because, you know, the westerly winds bring that moisture to the east. And so um, so most of the water actually comes from the eastern tributary, so it is kind of noteworthy. And, um, yeah, I just kind of want to show you, you know, some of the western tributaries. And so individual tributaries feeding into the Missouri. I mean, there's a lot of erosion going on. And, you know, if you just saw Yellowstone Falls eroding that gorge. And, you know, and so the Yellowstone River is flowing into the Missouri River. And this one is called the Milk River. I mean, it's just kind of, it's kind of a white sediment uh, feeding into the Missouri River. So you've got a lot of individual tributaries. Uh, with a lot of erosion going on in those individual drainage basins. Uh, uh, yeah, so I, I just kind of, one final thing about the Mississippi River uh, drainage basin. I want to talk about, you know, when we're going to have 
flooding in Louisiana. And, it, you know, as it turns out, uh, you know, when there are big floods, you know, in the upper basin, and we've seen big floods over the last couple of decades on the Missouri River, and it's certainly devastating, you know, for, <laughs> you know, the areas, the cities uh, along the Missouri River. But as it turns out, uh, because it is a semi-arid area in the western U.S., the Missouri River only pr provides about 1% of the water inflow to the Mississippi River. And it actually the blue represents the amount of flow or discharge, right? And so you can kind of see the small line. Now, we've got the rainy climate of the eastern US. It's the Ohio River, right? The Ohio River actually percent uh, provides 80% of the water flow coming into the Mississippi River. And so when there is a big flood in the Ohio River Basin, huge flood. That's when we need to worry, all right? A little 1%, you know, or a little increase in flow in the Missouri represents nothing to the state, the river stages for us in Louisiana. But with an 80% flow, all right, and then a flood in addition to that, that's when you watch out. And that's when we're going to have a flood in Louisiana. And that's what I'm, I'm just noted here. And it's going to have a huge impact on river stages. And of course, you know, you know, we're protected by artificial levees. And so, you know, if we don't have a break in the levee, we won't flood. But that's when you'll see, you know, uh, Mississippi River water right at the top of the artificial levees. All right, moving on to the final way in which rivers carry their load. And it's called the bed load. And this is the heavier materials, all right? Heavier, even sand grains are, are too heavy to be kept in constant turbulent suspension. Uh, and then, of course, larger cobbles and even boulders, right, that, that are too heavy to be kept in you know, suspension. So they're going to move, usually during floods, and that's when they're going to push push the sand and the cobbles and the boulders along the bottom by rolling and sliding. And here's an example of a bed load river in, in Costa Rica. And you know, and these rocks do move right during during big flood events. And again, I want to talk to you about, you know, the Mississippi, of course. Uh, you know, so the Mississippi River has a sand bed load. And so the sand bed load is being pushed along, you know, the course of the river, it's over 2,000 miles long, and the sand bed load is pushed and pushed and pushed until it reaches, you know, the, the Gulf of Mexico. And that sand bed load is pushed out into the Gulf of Mexico, and then that sand bed load is redistributed along the coast by waves and tides and currents. And so where do beaches come from? It is the bed load of rivers. It is the bed load of rivers. So in this case, we've got the sand bed load, but you can have, uh, you know, cobble beaches from, you know, cobble bed load rivers and on and on. All right, I want to move on to the fifth and final topic. Um, are, the, are the two basic types of river channel shapes? Uh, and the first shape is called a meandering river. And a meandering river, you know, you know has S-shaped curves. It's a single channel. And, uh, of course, the Mississippi River, right, is, is the classic example of a meandering river right, with a single channel with S-shaped curves. Here's a, a really highly meandering river up in Canada. It's called the Beaten River. And look at how highly meandering it is right in through here. All right, there's a, an important term that I want to introduce you to. The term is called alluvium. And this is a term uh, for any sediment deposited by the river, right? And so the bed load, right? In the river meandering, here's some of the bed load here. The white sand bed load is exposed at, you know, low water levels. And so in its meandering, the river is going to deposit its bed load as it's moving around. So we can actually see the low water, you know, with the bed load in the channel. But here on the floodplain, you can see where the river's been. You can see that same bed load. All right, same bed load. And here's the same thing for the Mississippi River here. We've got some sand bed load exposed as sandbars. All right, and here's some sandbars here. But you can see, you have evidence in all the agricultural fields on the floodplain. You can see that white sand bed load all over the place as the river has meandered and then deposited that sand bed load. And that's alluvium. Now, also, the suspended load, 
also gets deposited. Now remember, that's the tiny silt and clays that remain in turbulent suspension, you know, in the flow of the river water. But when the river is in flood, right, and goes over bank for weeks at a time and inundates all or part of the floodplain, the water is sitting there, right, stagnant. And over those weeks, those tiny silts and clays will actually fall out of the water and be deposited onto the floodplain. So you need a flood to get that suspended load to be deposited, forming alluvium. All right. Yeah, so in terms of uh, meandering rivers, I did want to you know, talk to you about two specific landforms uh, in relation to meandering rivers. And I, I just mentioned the term floodplain. And, you know, you know, what is a floodplain? Well, it is a plain that floods. <laughs> rivers in their natural state flood periodically, usually every few years, you know, two, three, four, five years. That's the, that's the normal thing, right? Rivers flood, and, and so they flood onto their flood plain. And what winds up happening, um, it, so the river's flowing in a valley, and over time, it's going to be depositing its sediments as it meanders. So particularly as, as it meanders, it's going to be depositing its bed load. And then when the river in its natural state, you know, has a, a flood every few years, it's going to go over a bank, inundate its, you know, a good part of the floodplain, and the water is going to be stagnant. It's going to deposit its suspended load. And so what winds up happening, the valley where, where the river starts flowing uh, starts to be filled with alluvium. And when you wind up creating a floodplain, right? So a floodplain of a meandering river is composed of alluvium, both the bed load, right, and uh, the suspended sediment load. And so here we've got the alluvium here. And here I've got a picture, a topographic map of a meandering river. You can see the floodplain here, floodplain here. And it's been meandering around and it's flowing on its own deposits of alluvium. Now I've got up here... Uh, uh, the second landform that I want to introduce you to, and it's called the bluff. And this is the high ground marking the outer edges of the floodplain. It's the boundary of a floodplain. And so here's the bluff here, some higher elevation, and it's always some other geology. Right? Some other geology, not necessarily alluvium. If it was, it would be some you know, other alluvium, older alluvium. But usually it's some other rock, bedrock, or sediment. Uh, you know, unrelated to the current uh, you know, meandering and alluvium of the current river. So what winds up happening, the river uh, enlarges its floodplain by meandering and, and encroaches uh, into this other geology of the bluff. And so it can meander and cut into the bluff, and that's how it enl enlarges its floodplain. And as it cuts into the bluff, it'll erode sediment, and that'll become part of the bed load or even suspended load. And that's actually what this river is doing here, is trying to enlarge its floodplain, and it's actually cutting into the bluff, right, and through here and eroding the bluff. And you can actually see, I mean, the higher ground, this is a topographic map, right, and through here, you can see the higher ground of the bluff, and here it's really high right here, where all the lines are really close together, that means it's really, really steep. And uh, here it is cutting into the city, whatever city this is here. I wanted to show you some uh, pictures of the Mississippi River Bluff. Uh, the bluff becomes prominent, uh, at, you know, on the east bank at, at about Baton Rouge. Uh, and here, you know, here's the old state capital, the castle. It's built on the, the high bluff. It's about you know, 30 feet, you know, higher than, you know, the current level of the Mississippi River. And uh, of course, it's, the bluff is contoured here to make the steps. Uh, but that's kind of, that's where the uh, the bluff becomes kind of prominent. Yeah, and so here we are in Baton Rouge. That's just kind of where the bluff begins on the eastern bank here. And so you might be saying, you know, you know we're in Homa and Thibodeau. You know, where's the bluff around here? You're not going to find the bluff, right? We're on uh, the Deltaic Plain. We're not really part of the floodplain of the Mississippi River. We're on a uh, land that was created over the last 9,000 years uh, by overlapping delta lobes, you know, as the Mississippi River entered the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and so this is uh, where you kind of start to pick up the floodplain. You know, at about Baton Rouge, and uh, here's Franklin here, and Lafayette is on the western bluff, and then the bluff kind of continues on up. And so, you know, we've just got, you know, deltaic deposits, marsh, and swamp here. All right, so we're not really... 
actually in the floodplain. And here we're here it's actually called the Mississippi River Alluvial Plain. All right, that's what they're often called. All right, I just want to show you a picture of uh, the bluff in, at Natchez. I mean, the bluff kind of continues, of course, uh, you know, up, upstream, and the bluff gets higher. And I just want to show you what's you know, the high bluff at Natchez. It's almost 200 feet high, so the bluff gets higher and higher as you move uh, upstream. And uh, what's been happening here uh, is the Mississippi River has been cutting into the bluff at the town of Natchez. And it, it got to the point where it was eroding the bluff and eroding the bluff and removing the front yards of these, you know, beautiful homes and even, you know, antebellum mansions. And it was going to get to the point where these these houses were going to fall into the Mississippi River. You know, and uh, so the Army Corps of Engineers had to step in to protect, you know, the, the town of, of Natchez. And they reinforced the bluff with concrete and, you know, whatever reinforcement. And uh, and here it is here, all finally completed. And uh, here they've kind of protected, <laughs> not much, you know, front yard left, but they protected it. Uh, and so you don't go any further, all right? They stop, stop, all right? And so anyways, if you ever go to Natchez, it, there are some hotels there, and it's really kind of, uh, kind of nice to look out, you know, over the Mississippi River with a good view at, on that high bluff. All right, remember what we're talking about are two different shapes of uh, river channels. We were just talking about uh, the single channel, uh, you know, meandering river. Uh, there was another type of channel called a braided river channel. Now, this, in contrast, has multiple channels right, that, you know, uh, come to join and come together and separate around sediment bars. So it's a multiple channel river. Now, what's going to make a, a multiple channel river, you know, with this braided shape? All right, you're always going to have a braided river pattern when that river is being introduced with so much bed load that it can't carry it. And so it winds up depositing it as sediment bars. All right, sediment bars, sand or gravel or boulder bars. And so it's, and so the flow winds up dividing around all the sediment that it can't carry. And, uh, I just want to give you a couple of examples of where you'll find braided river channels. You're always, like I said, you're going to find them where, you know, uh, you've got a high bed load supply that the river can't carry. Now, this picture is actually a braided glacial outwash stream, and they're always braided. Uh, so there's a melting glacier off the top of this picture. Now, as we're going to learn in our last lecture on glaciation, uh, Glaciers are tremendous eroders of the landscape, and all of that eroded debris becomes incorporated in the ice as the ice is moving along. And once that ice melts, it's going to release not only floods of water, it's going to release all of that rock and sediment that it eroded. And so invariably, you've got, uh, you know, all of this bed load, right, uh, that's being released from that melting ice. You know, uh, another example are in deserts, you know, uh, so you've got dry river channels, usually big dry sand bed river channels, but after a rain, uh, you know, because of a lack of protective vegetative cover and overland flow, they're going to supply, you know, a lot of water because there's low infiltration, they're going to flash floods, but they're ca also capable of eroding a lot of the sand, you know, on the surface. So usually when a river is flowing in a desert, it's indeed going to be braided. In deforested areas, yeah, you know, after lumbering activities, you know, the, after rainfall, uh, you'll wind up, uh, you know, contributing a lot of eroded debris uh, to the river system. And actually, anywhere where there are large earth moving projects, you know, we've got big uh, construction projects, you know, that, that can last, you know, for years, you know, big interstate highways or giant malls or, you know, whatever, huge suburban, uh, uh, you know, construction projects that last for years. And they bring in, you know, just you know, dumpsters and, and, and truckloads of, you know, sand or sediment to build up the area. And it's actually been shown with these long-term projects that if there was a meandering creek in the area or meandering stream, you know, over those few years where all that sand is exposed during, you know, these earth-moving projects, the river will actually turn braided because of all the erosion going on. Then once the project is done, the river will turn back meandering again. 
And so that's kind of an interesting thing. Now, I want to give you a really big example of that. And that's the Mississippi River during the Ice Age. Now, of course, the Mississippi River today is the classic example of a meandering river. But back here, we've got a picture 18,000 years ago during the Ice Age when all of Canada was covered by an ice sheet, an ice sheet. And so it was starting to melt back, you know, starting about 18,000 years ago. And the Mississippi River was the major glacial outwash stream. And we can only imagine what the Mississippi River must have looked like. There were huge floods as, you know, as the ice was melting. And then you know, all of the, the debris that had eroded from Canada, you know, gravel and sand and boulders and icebergs flowing on down the Mississippi River. And so uh, it was a braided river. And actually, if you remember when we talked about the sand and gravel aquifer that's about a thousand feet below the surface, I mean, that's actually, you know, some of the braided river deposits. And then once the, uh, the ice sheet, you know, completely melted about 9,000 years ago, well, the, all the source of all of that flood water and all that coarse debris ended. And about 9,000 years ago, that's when the Mississippi River turned into its current meandering right uh, system and then it deposited you know hundreds or you know, thousands of, of feet of alluvium on top of all of that braided river alluvium and so that ends this lecture